So yeah, we're here to talk about Django in the real world, which is sort of the mostly issues about scale and performance uh, using within your Django app. Uh, before we get started, I'll have the panel introduce themselves. Uh, I'm Jacob Birch. I'm an engineer at RevSys. Hello, uh, I'm Holmes Akadal. I, I was sadly no, uh, don't work with Django anymore, but uh, I was an engineer at Whiskey Media that uh, later became Berman Braun, so I have uh, experience with running, uh, running larger content websites. I am Frank Wiles. I'm the president of Revolution Systems, and we help companies with scalability and performance problems around Django. I'm Peter Baumgartner, founder at Lincoln Loop. Uh, and we both build large-scale uh, Django projects for clients and also help them out of uh, performance jams as well. I'm Andrew Dobbin. I'm a senior software engineer at Eventbrite, and we sort of have a big, like, transactional role in content kind of issues and scale. Uh, so before we get started, I'll just sort of lay out the format of this. We're going to try to do 15 to 25 minutes of um, me asking these guys a bunch of questions, really common questions that come up, and we're hoping to have a longer 15 to 20 minute Q&A session for you guys to ask any questions you want uh, of these guys. I want to start. Uh, problems of scalability and performance are often sort of ton in cheek labeled as happy problems. Um, if you're having a lot of data or you have a lot of customers and you have a lot of bandwidth, a lot of traffic, uh, these are usually good problems to have. Um, because of this, engineers and data architects and software architects will often prematurely optimize, uh, even worse, uh, worry about premature optimization. Uh, and so, what advice would you get people before they even run start project? Uh, what should they actually spend time on and make sure they get right the first time? And what does it matter until they actually have uh, the, the happy problems? And so, yeah, well, Peter, you can start. Um, well, I would say early on, you definitely want to optimize for developer productivity. Um, you know, your goal is to build features and, and get this thing out in the wild as soon as possible. Um, the, the things you want to avoid are making technology decisions that are going to you know, shoot you in the foot uh, later on. So um, I, I would say, you know, it, you don't need, uh, you know, if you, if you think you're going to scale, you don't need to grab some, like, crazy esoteric database that, uh, you know, you think is going to solve your scalability problems. I would say um, the, probably the biggest thing is to stick to the kind of uh, known tried and true solutions. Um, don't reinvent the wheel and uh, keep in mind you can scale uh, with bigger boxes for a pretty long time until uh, you're scalability problems become code problems. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you know, use stuff like Postgres and, uh, you know, a good WSGI server or an Nginx or Varnish. Um, these things will get you really far. So uh, I would say don't, you know, don't sweat it too soon and don't use, uh, you know, don't pull in some crazy technology just because you think you're going to need it. And I'll also add to that, I... 100% agree, and I would add to that, get into habit of monitoring system, uh, systems and looking into how things go. Once you move into production, you should always have record how things were, how things are now, and where do you spend most of the time, or what, what component is giving you the, the most problem. Even if you start with absolutely standard stuff, you should have this in place so you can later identify what's the problem, and you'll never have to sort of guess and assume that this will help you, or that that's a problem, and that's the component that you need to rewrite. And sort of feeding into that as well, like I've seen a lot of code that was written to be very clever, and then six months, let's be a startup, six months down the line, the people or the, the sort of the knowledge of that has moved on, and you go back, like this is suddenly a massive technical debt. So like I would heavily encourage simple solutions with well-known problems and well-known technology because. If you want to bring in people or bring in sort of external contractors, you want them to know what's going on as fast as possible by giving them this strange esoteric environment with special new modules and a new database type you made yourself. You're digging yourself your own hole at that point, I think. So everything that they've said is absolutely true, and, and you should absolutely do those things. But I think that it's kind of a natural peak inclination to want to figure out what's the, what's the fastest way to do this. Um, so I often will think about what happens when. Is there a clean, easy way to shard this data when we get there? Let's game that out. Let's make sure we don't write ourselves into a corner so that it makes that impossible 12 months down the road. Or, you know what, if I denormalize this way, I will be able, you know, my, I know my access patterns are going to be like this, and if I denormalize this and I use Redis, then 
boom, I've, I've got a whole bunch more performance. I don't actually go write that code. I just kind of whiteboard and game out what, what would I do when I get there. And so that satisfies the, the geek in me that wants to know like, what we would do. And then we also kind of have a plan for when we get there, but we don't set up you know, technological roadblocks that make everything slow for the early development. So I want to talk about the other side of things. When you have a site or an app that you, you did those things, you set it right, and now it's against the wall, it hit the fan, and it, um, it got slash dotted, it got fireballed, and all of a sudden uh, things aren't going well. But before we do that, uh, I was talking to Hansa yesterday, and we wanted to make sure we sort of clarified a, a key vocab issue that comes up a lot when you start talking to people um, about performance or scalability, and that's what is performance and what is scalability. Uh, they're often interchanged with, they all, they're often get using conversations with, my website is slow, how do I make it not slow? Or I have a billion rows of data and I can't fit it anymore. Um, so Hansa, since we talked about it, do you want to address that first? Yeah, so uh, performance is how fast can uh, how fast can you serve your content. And that's very important for user experience and for general like operation side. And it, it helps the scalability, but it's not the same thing. Scalability is the question, will I be able to serve 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times the amount of transactions, people, or content based on my, on my current stack. So that's the scale. Like, will it scale to uh, serve more? And it doesn't necessarily uh, have to be the same as performance. You can have systems that are, that are super fast but don't scale at all. And you can have systems that are fairly slow but will scale infinitely. For example, if you chose to use S3 as your, as your database, it will scale almost infin indefinitely. But it will never be really fast. So anything to add to that? I think it's also sort of a difference in the approach. Um, so certainly at Eventbrite, performance for us is... So, like, you know, we get a 5 cent, cent, 10 cent speed gain if we're lucky out of the main rendering flow. And that, that buys us a few months of headway. But the real sort of future planning comes from scalability. Like, you know, we need to plan, plan to serve 10, 100 X people. Like, a 10 cent speed increase is great, but it's only a short term solution. Like, you can't get by growing forever on just a series of small increases. You have to be able to have that big switch. And so, you know, like, you know, we, we did a thing with Django's regular expression URL server that gained us 5, 10%, which is fine, but then. The server resources we gain were gone in like two months from that because we grow at that speed. So it's important, I think, to sort of see them as different kind of things. Sometimes you need performance gains, sometimes you don't. Cool. Um, so, yeah, let's go back to websites that are actually need some of these sort of early gains of they either got really popular or the, uh, all of a sudden they have a lot of customer data that they need to store right away. And um, all they're observing is we have this cool app and now things are slow. Uh, now the website is crashing. Um, what do we do? Uh, what are, um, where, where should people look first when this happens and what kind of questions should they be asking themselves and where should they look to, to fix their problems? So as I said earlier, into their monitoring, they should they should know they should have been monitoring all along, like and seeing it get to get to that place, so they will know which part is the problem. Now this is Django in the real world, so let's say that oh, sorry. isn't true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, so in that case, experiment and try try to identify the, the the piece that's giving you trouble, replace that. And the important part is if you replace something, for example, you uh, a real in the real world, we found that we have a problem when Google hits our site and they try to paginate to the 100,000th page. We literally had 100,000 pages. And uh, it was getting Postgres, obviously, because it was sorted by three different, three different ways. It was a huge data set. So we replaced that with pagination with the help of Redis. So we would use Redis to paginate and then just use Postgres to retrieve the rows. And then we went and so where else can we use this pattern to alleviate the, uh, the pain that we have? So once we, fi once we fixed one instance, we say, oh, now we have a different tool. What, what other uses for this tool we also have where it might help us? So this is also always a second step that not many people actually, actually do. Um, yeah, I would say if you don't have good data, just uh, going in and looking at the load on your servers. Is your database server overheating? Is your app server overheating? Figuring out where the hotspot is, uh, just on the big scale, is it you know, is it my database, is my application?
information and then uh, you know, attacking it from that angle. If you can scale up vertically, that's uh, you know, a, a quick, easy win. Throw some money at the problem, throw some hardware at it. Uh, otherwise, um, you know, sometimes uh, really kind of quick and dirty caching solutions like a database query cache. If your database is uh, getting hammered, there's um, stuff like, uh, let's see, we use Johnny Cache, um, Cache Machine, Ops, Django Cash Ops. There's there's a few out there that will just uh, you know a, a few lines of code uh, can take off a, a ton uh, of pressure from your database. And then the same goes if your if your app server is overheating. Yeah, you can add more app servers or you throw a cache out in front of it, put put varnish uh, in front of it, and just have it cache all your anonymous users. Uh, we were just talking about this earlier. It doesn't need to be for hours. It could be for five minutes. Um, Um, so, uh, so far we've talked about um, sort of the ecosystem around a Django app. We've heard uh, Redis mentioned, Varnish mentioned, uh, Memcache mentioned. Um, is there anything missing in Django up to Django 1.7 uh, that you feel should be uh, in core to help ease growth? Uh, it's sort of always been Django's mandate to be very easy to get started and possible to scale out. Um, do you feel there's anywhere in Django that is uh, either not in core and needs to be sort of smoothed out along that way? Um, so there's a couple of things I have my eye on for a while. So I know um, Hans as well, the, the Q abstraction is one of Hans' sort of ongoing uh, uh, things. I'd also love some kind of um, message bus abstraction. Um, because in particular, Eventbrite, as we're pulling things to separate services, some kind of way, like if we had had that in there in the first place and said that, you know, these things, like Celery is, is great for sort of moving tasks off, but it's not enough like cache and validation and stuff. So like I would love to see some kind of Decent way of sending messages to multiple targets in Django with say, like, hey, we have made new events, so we can invalidate all the pages. We have sold the tickets, so we can validate the accounts and stuff. Like, that to me is almost the missing piece, at least for the things we're facing now. Um, I'm not sure it would help a small site, but perhaps it plays into like you know like live data binding, like you know, utility meteor does, right? Like, perhaps we can have something where like you know we can have live data from this kind of system. It's, it's a it's a theory, but I'd like to see something like. Um, I think there's some improvements that could be made to the cash framework in general. That's a piece that we seem to override a lot. Um, uh, one thing, like uh, on a high traffic site, if you're using the cash framework quite a bit, um, you tend to see uh, these spikes as as your cache invalidates um, spikes on uh, you know your application, and then you know everything gets cached and it goes back down, and you get into this kind of wave. So uh, one thing we do ourselves doing is just adding like jitter into the cache timeout so you know cache timeout varies by 10 percent and you don't have all your content invalidating at the same time um, there's a couple other things I'm uh, slipping my mind but I know you guys are great with that. <laughs> I know the trend is to try and take things out of core and put them out uh, but I think that something a little, a little more instrumentation into core so things like if, if run server as part of you know the logs showed you how many queries were run. Something that Django Debug Toolbar does great, but something that was built into the system. Um, we could have a little bit better probably testing, uh, unit testing tools around some of those things. Um, I know I end up writing like a, you know, a certain number of queries is less than this amount. Like I, I don't need to have it know that it's exactly 12. It's, it, it wasn't in one six, yeah. There's a certain number of queries like that it's exactly 12, but I just want to say, hey, you know what, I only want to, have this fail if it jumps over 50, something like that. You know, we, could, we could get a little bit better around those, those kinds of things. Cool. I'd just like to say that uh, a lot of the things that have been said here actually don't need to be in, in Django. For example, what Peter said with it adding, adding jitter, it's something that you don't have to worry about at the beginning. And once you see this behavior, you can just grab an off the shelf cache backend from, from GitHub, from PyPI, and just, and just plug it in and it's a drop in replacement. It's also something that you don't, for example, use in development or in, in your staging environment. So those are the ways how, how you can progress. You start with a, with a na naive vanilla Django, and then you uh, start replacing components, for example, for session storage or for the caching. Uh, we also had our uh, our own uh, cache backend, which actually does like uh, the thundering herd protection that it will randomly 
not return the cash value once, so it will get regenerated in the background instead of just uh, having potentially multiple threads trying to do the same work, and so on and so forth. We also expose a lot more because we use Redis as our cache, so we expose a lot more functionality there uh, instead of just the increment that, that the cache backend has, we, uh, we do more. And that's something that you can introduce later. So it's all to tie to the previous questions. Like you don't have to worry about this in the beginning, but know that these are the places that give you a lot of, uh, a lot of potential to, to do better. Yeah, I, th I think instrumentation in general is um, something like even production instrumenta instrumentation. Uh, uh, I know um, you guys at Lanyard are using some kind of like backwards methods to get into, you know, how many how many queries did this request fire off, and then you know I want to store that data or I want to send it to StatsD or something like that, um, to, so I can track that uh, performance over time. Um, it would be nice to to have some some better hooks into that uh, information in production. Yeah, so the, the thing, I think you talked about Tiki Bar, I imagine, or the, uh, the, anyway, the, 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 the Eventbrite has a thing called Tiki Bar, which is a similar to describe where like, we track the queries you run, that kind of stuff. Um, there is a, definitely a lack of hooks in Django to have a easy third party drop in for implementation. And one of the things that now migrations is much more done, um, I'd like to look at is having those hooks in there. So we, like, you can say like, okay, I do want to see every query that comes through in this list, or I do want to like wrap this in a timer and that kind of stuff. Like, you know, I'd like to know how long my URL resolving takes occasionally, or how long my database calls take, how, my, how long my cache calls take. So if we can have some easy solution that it doesn't increase the overhead, which is the key problem, because Django gets, unfortunately, a little bit slower every release, then that would be a good thing to look at. So this will be uh, the last question before we open it up to the floor. Um, four years ago, actually, not in this room, I was on the other side of the river, but I moderated a panel uh, on those SQL solutions at DjangoCon. Um, and it was such a popular topic that it was a plenary session. It was everybody. Um, and four years since then of, of wonderful NoSQL pro progress, uh, it barely warrants a mention in this talk. Um, why do you think that is? Uh, was the hype real? Um, yeah, I'll open it from there. First of all, the term NoSQL is objectionable to me. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, so yes, I mean, there was, especially at that time, the prevalence of things. Like MongoDB is by far and away the most prevalent thing at that point in history. I think what's happened since then is that people have gone through that process, have seen that what they're exchanging, what they're giving up in exchange for that kind of you know, document storage is some things that you kind of rely on later on when you're scaling, like things like indexing and easy changes and persistent data formats. Um, and also at some point it's kind of become more assumed, like you know, Postgres now has pretty much first class support for schemaless stuff, like if you just have JSON fields, they have indexes, it's I believe in the next release faster than Mongo is on most common queries. Um, so I think it's kind of a combination of that and then also things like Redis and, and Cassandra and React just became normal parts of the web infrastructure. Like the, the, st the stuff that proved itself just became almost assumed. Like I, I still see talks about that stuff at conferences where people are like, well, you know, obviously we use Redis and we use Postgres and we use you know, Elasticsearch or Solar because those are the three very complementary things. They're like they can't do each other's jobs. You can't, you know, you could write a search engine in Redis if you wanted to. That's, that's crazy talk. So I think that's kind of like the, we've settled down almost on the sort of more decided set of scripts. Uh, yeah, I think the, you know, the talk at the time was, you know, how are we going to get uh, the admin to work on MongoDB or Redis? And, um, yeah, I think we've now learned that you don't, there's no need to do that. You don't need to use these as your primary data store. Um, for most people, most scenarios, a uh, relational database system is uh, what you want to use for your primary data store. Um, but there's all sorts of peripheral needs uh, where those types of databases come in really, really handy, uh, like search and sorting and uh, the kind of stuff that relational databases don't do as well. And also, like, if you use something else than relational data store, you don't want to treat it as a relational data store, so there is no reason to pretend to hide it behind the same API to use the, the Django query set to query Elasticsearch or Redis. That, that in that case, like, 
the different data store gives you nothing because you cannot use uh, its entire power. You're limited to what a, what, a, what a SQL database could do. So it doesn't make much sense. And people have realized like the, the ultimate promise of the NoSQL movement, I'm sorry, was like, choose the right tool for the job. So if you have a search problem, use, use a search engine. If you just want something quick and easy and very easily updatable, use Redis. If you want something persistent and reliable, use Postgres. And like, you can mix and match those. Just one, one adjunct to the admin conversation. Um, one of this year's GSOP projects has been about exposing non-model things to the admin. Um, so, you know, for example, there has been, uh, um, I think it was Russ, your student, who was doing, like they, they had Gmail backed onto the admin. So like some progress has been made in that kind of area, separate from the whole sort of NoSQL movement as a, as a whole thing. But you know, it's, it's, it's a different thing. The admin is a whole other topic and a whole other panel, I think. <laughs> All right, so we'll open the floor to questions. We've got about a little over 20 minutes for them. So any questions you have for these guys, please come up. Uh, the microphone is on um, my right, your left. Oh, we have both mics. I'm sorry. I'm totally wrong. Either side works. Uh, hey, gentlemen. Thanks for the awesome panel. Um, I, I'm wondering, I, I think... Without exception, we heard about uh, elements of the app stack and their implications and performance and scalability. Uh, I, I'm kind of inclined to ask the same start project question that started this panel, uh, but for the you know deployment tooling. Uh, is it better, do you think, to use the, like a, a company starting today, a small project starting today? Uh, do they do like Jenkins from day one and Ansible and Docker from day one? Do you use the hot, the, whatever is hot and new the day that you start? And what are the risks of that becoming a tradition and, and so on? So I, I think this feeds into my, my one of my first responses that you should use whatever is common and is going to get it. Like, you know, at some level, these are all deployment tools. They all have some level of commonality. Like I personally prefer Docker um, as, as more personal preference. Like, I designed a thing similar to that a while ago. Um, but I think whatever your team, whatever gets in your way the least is fine. Because like deployment, generally, you can change later on. It's not sort of fi a fixed constant. Like you can change the deployment system usually without downtime because it's sort of ancillary to your main project. So I would say whatever, whatever you feel most comfortable with as a small technical team, I would go with that. Um, obviously, excluding things like, don't, don't use Bash scripts, use a real tool. Uh, but like, you know, between Ansible and Puppet and Chef and Docker and Jenkins. I'm inclined to, to fire back that, that uh, you know, Ansible playbooks and Jenkins config are fairly substantial bits of logic. I, I'm not sure that they're, you know... They, oh, they I'm, I'm not saying they're not, but, you know, at some point, you're saving time on those in the first few deploys, and then everything after that is always payback. So I think don't, do, you know, don't have the gambler's fallacy. Don't think because you, you've invested so much effort into it, you can't change. Like, a deployment tool saves you time pretty much from day two or three. Because, like, you, you, like, it's not only how fast deployments are, but it's the confidence in deploying it's the speed of the way. It's, it's the fact that you can just go hit a button and just sort of go and get some team like this is fine like I'm not sort of stressed and typing commands and like accidentally removing files so like it, it, it's more than just speed and, and time investment I think. Thanks so much. Um, I, you mentioned monitoring several times and I'm wondering what sort of monitoring you love and a particular question also about monitoring is um, if you recommend keeping things like the Postgres logging on in production or not. Uh, you know, getting started, uh, New Relic is pretty fantastic. Uh, currently, you can send me about 20 bucks later. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but <laughs> I mean, honestly, like for, for the amount of effort it takes uh, to, to, to get there, um, that's, I think, you know, for people starting out, that's, that's what you should do. Uh, at some point, there's information you're going to want that New Relic can't provide, and there's other tools to do that, but um, that, that's not a trivial uh, undertaking to get a, a, a you know, kind of a full-blown like, monitoring system. Like Munin or something? Yeah, or, you know, like, uh, yeah, Munin, there's uh, Kibana and Elasticsearch, there's Grafana and Graphite, uh, there's, you know, a, a million tools out there. I think those are, you know, I think I think there's a couple of different things. You, you want to know what your, what your logs are doing, so that's, uh, you know, kind of Kibana, Elasticsearch thing you want, and then you want to know the, the numbers, you know, how, 
how much traffic am I getting, what are the response times and all that, and that's more of a kind of Graphite and Grafana or you know, any of the other tools there. Yeah, I think that the, it depends on the size of your company and whether or not you have ops staff, exactly what you pick. If you have dedicated ops people, then they're going to have decent ideas about what they'd like to use, and you just need to kind of tell them what you'd like to be able to see uh, or what things you think are important. If you don't, use a service. You know, there's hosted Graphite, there's Keen.io, there's all sorts of places that you can push this data, and all it is is a little bit of setup config and, and you know, a hundred bucks a month or something um, for to, to your organization to get these services up and running, and it, it gets you started. Um, it, I, uh, I think it took me more than a full day to get a fully working Graphite setup, following tutorials online, and I'd like to kind of think that I could set up a Django app pretty quickly, but it took me like a whole day. So it's easy to get into a time suck setting these things up and then abandoning them and go, you know, we'll do that later. When we really need this, we'll set it up later. Just use a service or something and get the data at some point somewhere that you can look at it. What do I think the Postgres logging? Like, I know there's a lot of great Postgres analyzers out there, or, or maybe they're not. I was wondering what you that, I, I think it's fine to do. Um, just don't log it to the same disks that the box is using for data and indexes. So use syslog, ship it off to another box. And then like run PG Badger over it, or you know shove them into Kibana so that you can look at specific queries and patterns and things. But yeah, the, the biggest thing is just don't have the don't have the Postgres logs going to the same disk that your data's on. Um, one tip with Postgres logs I want to just sort of bring up is that um, at Landed Element, right, we uh, insert the URL of the current page in the, as a comment into the SQL that we run. So even in the logs, we can see exactly where that that SQL query came from. So our slow query log says, well. These took 30 seconds, but they're from this URL. And so we can exactly pinpoint where those come from, which is a good sort of middle set that sometimes is missing in standard query logs. Um, I think uh, full full logging is good for uh, you know if you if you need like security or you know you have a breach or something and you want to be able to go back and say you know what what exactly ran. Um, but uh, a, a quick thing you can do if you're on a recent version of Postgres is uh, enable PG stat statements. Um, which is basically like a running slow query log. Uh, you can do all sorts of stuff, uh, and it um, yeah, it's really awesome. So uh, if you're if if what you're after is what queries am I running the most? How slow are they? You know what's taking the most time? Um, PG stat statements will get you all that pretty quickly. Um, I'm sorry, I need to start with the disclaimer. I actually work for Elasticsearch, which is currently the 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 weapon of choice for storing centralized logs. So I'm gonna advocate really, really heavily for uh, centralized logs. Now, the reason why I advocate for centralized logs is uh, those information are great, but you need to take them into context. So you need to know like, so I've had this heightened load on the, on the database. Did, I, did it also mean that I had more load? If then, it's okay. But if I had no more queries, uh, no more, uh, HTTP requests on my app servers, that means that something is wrong. And you need to sort of be able to correlate this. And that's where centralized monitoring and, and logging and everything can give you much more than each and individual uh, thing analyzed, even if that would be in more detail. Sort of to have this overview and to be able to identify patterns. So as uh, Frank said, yeah, use, a, use a service throw all the logs somewhere, visualize them, and over time you will learn what, what was the most useful, so if you then grow big enough, congratulations, and you can, you can build it yourself with just the most useful thing, and then you can start adding your own information. For example, with logs, it's, it's great to in, in, uh, in index additional metadata, so structured logging, if you, if you log anything, add all the information is there, in there. It was this request by an uh, authenticated user or not? Uh, when, where did the user come from? And all this stuff that will give you more information. And if you, even if you just store it on disk so you can uh, backload it later or you will do it only if you run into problems, like even then to have this data, it's, it's invaluable to be able to identify where the bottleneck is or where the quickest win is. One mistake too, uh, real quick on, on logs that people make is 
they worry about how long they're going to keep them in a searchable state um, way too much. I mean, uh, I need to refer to logs multiple times a day uh, with different clients. I can't remember the last time that I needed more than four days ago. Um, the only reason I needed three days was because the issue happened after five o'clock on Friday and I'm just seeing it on Monday. And the reason that I needed for four days is sometimes I don't get to that email until Tuesday. Um, but like I've never even needed it a whole week. And so people worry about storing the last 90, 180 days. We were to keep a whole year in there. And that just slows down every query you're doing, which slows down your ops team and, and your ability to look at stuff. And you know, sure, off of that, they'd be able to load it in if you need to get to it, but you probably really only need to actually have indexed the last seven days of data in most cases. That's awesome. Could I ask one quick question? What was your name, by the way? Yeah, we have time. Sure. What was your name? Sorry. So that again? So what was your name, brother? Uh, I'm Andrew. And, um, yeah, I, you, your comment about putting in the URL, was yeah. that from the Django ORM? You're passing that as a comment in the SQL So, so um, one of the hacks we do to get instrumentation is that we wrap the cursor inside Django back in so we can add timers around it. And so part of that, we're already overriding it, so we can just add the comment at that point. Um, so we have some horrific things. I think there's a request thread local and some other horrific things that we shouldn't be doing. Do you have um, to inspect the call stack to get the method name? Oh, no, so, 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 um, there's a middleware that sticks the request into a thread local, oh. and then I think, well, you, you shouldn't do this. As, as <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, like, it's pretty the, re the result is fantastic. The methodology is not so much. It's, it's like, I want this stuff in Django. So I, so I want to be able to go in there and delete our horrible monkey patches and, and be like, we're much more pure now. But at the moment, it's more sort of just like grungy, but it works. Okay, thanks so much. Good. So, had some small ideas about you know code improvements that could go into Django. Where do you think there could be documentation improvements? There is like a, one of the frequently asked questions or some place buried in the documentation about small optimizations, but I don't even think they touch a single thing that you guys said in this panel. I mean, there is the caching framework, there is HTTP caching, but n nothing that really glues those all together and I know Peter, you're working on a book about this, which is an awesome resource to the community. But you know, where where could Django be better about helping at least point people in the right direction for some of these things? I mean, the, this is a problem. Sort of, it, it starts very much at this at tutorial, which is I mean, the part five now. The point does exist, but for a long time was neglected a little bit. Um, but you know, as you start with Django, there's this wonderful narrative thread of the tutorial. Brings all the ideas as a brief, like you know, it shows you like this exists, go in later, this exists, go in later, and then at some point it drops off and goes, and here's the reference docs. And of course, I'm sure five, six years ago they were much smaller, but now, like you know, even as part of migration, but we added like another like couple of like 20, 30 pages uh, of docs, and so reading all of it becomes very difficult. Um, I'm not sure what the best way to expose that is. Um, perhaps there is a call for some kind of or it's like you know, advanced reading topics or just sort of like a very brief summary of these other things that like for a long time people didn't know South existed. Like South is this assumed thing in Django, but nothing on the website said it existed because it wasn't official, it wasn't an official project. And so there was this weird thing where like every conference would be like people were like, Oh yeah, and you should do South on stage, but it was never in any setting that way. And that, that fixed itself eventually, but I I don't know, it is a problem. Um, I think at some point there is some aspect of community involvement, or I think books and things as well are very bad. Like, it, it, because like docs are two things. They're a learning resource and a reference resource. And Django is very good at the latter. Like, if I wanted to find out what a field is, I can find it almost instantaneously. But as a learning resource, I think that there is some improvement to be made. Uh, I think one hard thing is um, I, the Django docs are not opinionated, and I think that's a good thing. Um, they, uh, but I think when you get into this stuff, it's if you're learning, I think it's really good to have an opinionated resource. Like, you don't want to know that there's eight different whiskey servers that you could possibly use. You want somebody to just say, this is the good one, you should use this one. Um, and, and I don't know if that's Django Doc's place to, to say things like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, maybe it's, it's third-party resources that, you know, say... I, I, yeah, we've written a book that, that's doing basically this, but I, I think it was born out of, I, I, you know, we felt like there was a need for a, an opinionated resource that isn't, uh, doesn't belong in the, in the Django docs. The Django docs should be pretty 
agnostic on, on how, you, how you use it and everything. So, um, yeah, I think that's a challenge. And, and trying to cover all the bases is a, is a monumental task. And then you're, you know, I think it was a big deal to get UWSGI into the Django docs. Um, and now, you know, somebody has to maintain the UWSGI and the Apache. And I don't know if there's a, you know, two unicorn one and all this stuff. So maintaining all those different versions and then you drop the, the new user in and you say, well, you can do this or you can do that. And have fun. Uh, so, yeah, I, th I think that's the challenge in there. For about five minutes at DrangoCon EU, Russ and I talked a little bit about putting in, um, like, some automated checks um, that we've made absolutely no progress on. And I said that I was going to work on it, but I just now remembered that I'd said that. Um, so... <laughs> So uh, hopefully in the next couple of months, I'll get that done. Uh, but no, that looks for the very simplest common things, like you know, you're storing your sessions in the database. Just a, a management command that you can run against your existing settings and say, well, you probably shouldn't be doing that. That's you the should default. Hmm? That's the default. Yeah, that's the default, is, is to use the database, right. But that's appropriate for getting started. But it's really easy, and I've even done it on large production sites. I've forgotten to change that, and you know, you can get 20% better performance across the board just by swapping out and saying use Redis or Memcached. Um, so there's lots of little things that are easy to forget, you know, whether or not you're you know, using a cache template loader and things that are not, that are all in the docs, they're in the reference, that tells you exactly that this will get you better performance or this is, shouldn't be used in production, but there is no quick, easy, let me do a quick health check on my settings and see that, okay, I'm at least not doing the top 10 things that are bad. You know, I, I might need to do 10 more other things that are never going to, you know, that are going to be very site and project specific, but at least I'm not doing the 10, you know, easy, easy to fix things. Thank you. Russ. Sorry, I, I can't imagine the wine situation at Django Connie. You couldn't have had anything to do with the fact that you've forgotten what we were agreed we were going to do. <laughs> um, there are, there's multiple places where you can be attacking sort of performance and scaling issues. There's always the code stuff that, you know, Use an order one, order one algorithm, not an order n, n squared algorithm, and, and that sort of thing. But then at the, at the DevOps side, at the beginning, you sort of you, you did make the point about these are quite often problems you'd like to have, and you don't necessarily have to deal with them. There are vendors now who are out there, like Heroku and Gondor and whatnot, that sort of talk about the DevOps, and we'll just make the DevOps problem go away. And if you have load problems, just turn this knob, and we'll charge you more money, and everything will go away. How much of that is snake oil? How much of that is convenient when it's small, useful when it's large? And how do you determine when you cross that boundary? As someone who's written a service like this. Um, so a lot of the advantage in platforms like Heroku and stuff is that they're very architecture forces you to write scalably. So Heroku forces upon you several different constraints which you wouldn't have by default on your own system, which are things that are more scalable, like things like lack of writable data file system. This is a scalability thing. Things like your things aren't guaranteed to be on the same guaranteed to be on the same machine. Things like you know, they they enforce a whole different set of constraints, like the way, the way things boot up and run that naturally makes the whole thing like horizontally chargeable to some extent. So I think that part is not snake oil. Um, I think the turn the knob make it faster thing is a little bit like that. Um, especially because some problems aren't solved by just adding more servers. Uh, especially ones that are constrained by sort of cross-talk and cross APS access. Um, in particular, like, so Heroku Postgres, I think is almost the, the better product from them. Because like that actually does do a lot of stuff with Postgres that is very useful and tricky to do yourself. Like things like having um, followers and that kind of stuff. Um, but similarly, like, you know, you can't just at some point expect to make your website magically faster. If someone says they can do that, don't trust them. They're selling you a lie. Like, some part of it won't be true, but the entirety is probably not true. It's, it's, it's always hard work with all the new layers taking it. Yeah, I mean, if, if, uh, if, if those services really could just dial up the, the knob, um, Peter wouldn't have a reason to have written a book, and, and I, we wouldn't have a lot of clients. Um, no, you can get really, really far. It just gets very, very expensive. And at a certain point, the ROI, um, both in terms of kind of the flexibility to use the tools you want to use on the ops and dev side, and then just the sheer cost of those services make it make it cost effective to, you know, dedicate a person to look into these things for, for three months uh, or hire somebody like us to come in and, and, and do stuff for them. Um, it, you know, can get very, very expensive very, very quickly with those services by just dialing up the knob. Yeah, I mean, like the, if you properly, you know, once you're beyond a single server, you have, you know, which is, again, like this 
kind of what is enforced by Heroku. You know, you have your database server, you have your app server, and you have your static files getting served someplace else. Um, going from that to auto scaling your app servers, which have no state in them, is pretty easy. So going from one server to, well, maybe not one, but two servers to five to 10 to 100, that's easy. But all you're doing is pushing your pressure lower down the stack. So uh, you know if you're if you're scaling with two servers and there's no pressure on your database, and then all of a sudden, oh my app servers are overloading, and I need to add 50 of them now. That same database isn't going to handle that traffic probably. So you you pushed it down your stack, and now you need uh, either a bigger database or multiple databases, and and that's not as easy a thing to just to turn the knob on. Um, you require some kind of logic and, and stuff there. So, yeah, I think you know on your your stateless layer, auto scaling makes a lot of sense and works, but it, it doesn't get you uh, all the way there. And sort of on the of pushing things down, like you can go further. Like at some point, there are sites where the network engineering is the critical part. Like, sure, your apps are kind of the throughput. You have all the files, but the network engineering, like the the IP addresses, the unicast, the bandwidth, the throughput, the, the topology. That's the bit where the pressure is. And so, like, you know, you can't expect one solution to fit all problems. Like, you're thinking of, you've got things like Netflix is a very different kind of problem from a web for example. Like, we, they serve static content that's very easily shoddable. We have to do, like, transactional checks and sell an exact number of tickets and then stop. Um, but we have a very spiky load. Netflix have a very predictable, nice, rampy load. And so, you know, they're different challenges. Like, if all websites are the same, I suspect that this problem might be more solved, but it isn't, which is kind of fun for us in a way. I'll throw one more on there. Um, in the big data space, there's a big problem about knowing exactly what big data is. You know, I, I have a big data website that contains up to one gigabyte of data. Um, there's a similar sort of thing here with performance, where people say, you know, I've got a really, really high traffic website. I've got to deal with like four or five customers hitting me three or four times a second. Where, where do you kind of draw, draw the line? Of the, the, the sort of sites. When, where, what do you think of as a high traffic site that you actually need to start really seriously thinking about these problems versus? You know, okay, yeah, you might have a bit of traffic, but you really should be able to do that on just a single server and not worry about all this other stuff. So I think it depends on the, on the type of site. So I've run, I've run a site that got 4,000 requests a second before of one server because it was a very simple forum that was static. At the same time, the same number of requests in the Eventbrite takes an entire cluster because it's a very different kind of load. So I think it's not necessarily the number of requests a second. It's a lovely number to wave around. It's not that important. Like, you know, I'm sure CDNs get a lot more than anybody else does. And, that's you know, a very different kind of load. Um, although it's sort of a difficult job, I'm not saying they're easy to write. Uh, so I, I, I think it's the case, it's almost a, te a team thing. Like the point where the growth and the speed start out, out, outstripping your ability to code up to it easily, I think that's the point where things change. Like where a small team of a few people is no longer enough to keep up with an increasing load, where like you're constantly fire fighting, that's almost for me more the turning point where suddenly like you need an ops department, you need a separate sort of like QA department or whatever. Like I think that's the breaking point, at least in my head. Yeah, so again, as, as with monitoring the, the resource utilization or your machines, you can even monitor or pretend to uh, your team or your ability to cope. Like at some point you, you, you're, you're doing okay and it's linear and at some point you can see that you're not coping fast enough. So at that point you need like a quantum leap. You need to you need to change either by hiring more people, using different services, using different technology, or or something. So you can identify those points, and unfortunately, no one can tell you what the right solution for that would be, uh, unless you give them a lot of money. Uh, but that sort of that sort of uh, this metric will identify like where where it needs to happen. If you if you see that you're you're still doing okay and you you still have time to develop new features. You're, you're okay, you don't have to go looking for, for anything else. If you see that I'm still able to do that, but one month from now, based on the curves, I will not have any free time to actually develop the features, you, you need to do something. And it's, it's a pure and simple business, business calculation, like do I want to spend more money, do I want to spend, uh, hire more people, or do I want to hire a consultant, or do I want to spend time and investigate a better solution? Maybe a change of architecture, maybe change of features, whatever. Yeah, I, I think there's very, very few sites that get to that phase that you're talking about, or 
should be at that phase. Um, I think a lot of people like to think they are, or like to think that their you know their site is this unique flower that can't be handled by any tools that you know normal men have made, uh, men and women. Uh, and um, it, it's learning more about your stack and your tool set can can buy you so much time. Um, you know you. You find that one knob in Postgres or in Varnish or whatever that you turn, and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, I just doubled my throughput, you know, just by learning how, how my tool set works. So, you know, I would say you're you're at that point of you know scale is a major issue when the standard toolkit no longer serves your needs, uh, you know, and you, you really do have to you know invent invent new things to to make it work. And, and I don't think there's many people that or many uh, websites that really get to that phase where the standard toolkit doesn't work for them anymore. Cool, and we're out of time. Thanks, everybody.